Thanks all for coming. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Caitlin Morales Tyler, and I'm the stewardship coordinator with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP for short. Uh, so PCAP does a monthly Native Prairie Speaker Series, and we either do it as a webinar or an in-person event in the Saskatchewan community. And we cover topics related to uh, prairie conservation, species at risk, um, habitat loss, that sort of thing. So a uh, wide variety of topics. Um, and I'm really excited to be in Valmarie. <laughs> this is kind of our first uh, uh, speaker series in person since the COVID restrictions are taking place. I should turn this on. I've got gesture for that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, before we begin, I'd just like to start by stating we respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations and communities, past and present. For a millennia, they have worked to protect these landscapes and the life these areas sustain. I would like to thank these original caretakers and acknowledge the ongoing work and presence of Indigenous peoples in Canada today. Um, I also want to mention that PCAP has two upcoming webinars. November 17th, the Nature Conservancy of Canada is doing a presentation about the Western Family Prairie Grasslands Initiative. And on November 30th, Dinyar Minuchair, uh, formerly of Grasslands National Park, now of the, oh, I have to double check my notes here, Canadian Prairies Prescribed Fire Exchange, is doing a presentation about prescribed burning on the grasslands. Um, I would like to note that financial support for today's webinar is provided by Environment and Climate Change Canada, and in-kind support has been provided by Grasslands National Park. Now, I know some people know our presenter already, but I would like to introduce her because when I was reading her bio, there's a lot of things I didn't know. Uh, so, originally born and raised here in Saskatchewan, Allie's love for snakes were not discovered until her first biology job working with snakes, small mammals, and insects for the Royal Saskatchewan Museum's BioBlitz project located in the Big Muddy Valley. In the last nine years, she has since worked with various not-for-profits, NCC, Cows and Fish, Alberta Conservation Association, as well as master's students, and levels of government, such as the Governor of Saskatchewan and Parks Canada, and has worked on various research projects in Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Ontario. For her undergraduate thesis at the University of Regina, she researched the body condition of bull snakes in Saskatchewan. And most recently has completed her master's degree from Laurentian University, where she investigated the space use and habitat preferences of eastern hognose snakes in rural southwest Ontario. This was her first year working with Parks Canada in Grasslands National Park, where her primary role was investigating the road mortality of snakes around grasslands. So with that, I'm pleased to turn it over to Allie. don't like snakes is the element of surprise. 
uh, that comes with snakes. So the fact that you know you'll be walking along, minding your business, um, you know, don't hear anything, just enjoying the outside, and then all of a sudden you realize, oh, there's a snake by me. Okay, wasn't expecting that. So um, you know, we are not fans of being surprised. Basically, it's kind of you know, in from way back our ancestors, we, we don't like it. Not a cool thing. However, for myself, again, I love snakes. Um, there's a couple reasons why I do. So, first of all, the fact that they can uh, move around 95% of the time, pretty flawlessly, without any legs. Uh, when I walked over here with my own two legs, I tripped on the sidewalk, so I can't walk very gracefully. Um, another is that, you know, lays about and sunbathe all day. I think that would be really nice to have a basically lifelong vacation. And the fact that these creatures are so misunderstood and there is a negative stigma around them. So um, the, the times when I've been working with these snakes over the last nine years, I've found that they have personalities. Um, they really, they want nothing to do with us. Um, they're just, you know, living beings, have the have heyday as much as they can, um, and they're just little phenomenal creatures, in my opinion. So, um, I'll be covering again the snake biology species we have in Saskatchewan and studying snakes here in Grassland National Park. So, starting with snake biology. Well, there's supposed to be a snake there. Um, so, just like us, again, snakes are living, breathing beings. Um, they have older senses. It is a myth that snakes cannot hear. Um, they can hear. Uh, they can smell. It's a little bit different from what we are you know, used to for smelling. Um, they have touch. They can you know, they know what's around them. Taste, again, it's a little bit different from us as well as um, their eyesight. So for us, our eyesight is our strongest sense, uh, but for snakes, their scent um, and their taste is actually their strongest uh, sense. So basically, by using um, their sense of smell and taste, they're able to navigate their environment. So by sticking out their tongue, um, there's these, the scent particles that are coming around them that will run around their tongue and they'll say, okay, I realize that, so it's, it's four. So to the left of them, if there's scent particles that land on the left side, okay, there's something, you know, there's a, a dog beside me to my left. And their strongest sense um, being their sense of smell slash taste um, comes with the Jacobson's organ. So um, as you can see there, so the tongue, again, it is forked. And then directly in, under it is the Jacobson's organ that is directly connected to the nerve, which is directly connected to the brain. So it's really, really quick in terms of processing what's around them. Come on, that snake is not showing up. But anyways. Um, so again, yeah, as living, breathing beings, uh, snakes require some of the same things that we do. They require some sort of shelter, they require food, they grow, and you know they need to regulate their body temperature or body conditions in some fashion. So acquiring food. Well, for us, we can go to the grocery store. We can also plant a garden, go to a restaurant. But for snakes, how are they able to acquire food? Well, there's two ways. So the first being constriction. So these are mostly non-venomous snakes. Uh, so they tightly coil around their prey, and they squeeze them really tight. And the original thought was that their prey would eventually suffocate, and that's how the prey would die. But actually, there's um, some recent studies that have come out that have shown that it's actually the constriction cutting off the blood circulation of the prey, and the prey going into cardiac arrest. So not quite suffocating through airways per se, but um, suffocation through uh, blood loss and blood circulation getting cut off. And the other way is venom. Um, so again, the ones with kind of the fangs, um, spitting out venom. Uh, so with this way, it's a little bit more of a pass 
passive sit and wait for their prey to go by. Um, they're not an active foragers. They don't have to be because they have their venom. And so, um, kind of the, the indicators uh, between venomous and non-venomous snakes there. So, again, wouldn't recommend getting that close to the snake. <laughs> but, if you have a nice, lovely lens that you can, you know, if you're unsure, maybe it's a rattlesnake or a bull snake, you can zoom in. Uh, but the elliptical pupil, um, compared to our round pupil, and then the nostrils, as well as the pit on our vipers there. So, um, again, we'll be see in some future photos, but those look more like nostrils than their actual nostrils are. So, the pit is a heat sensing pit, and any heat signature that their prey, um, you know, that wanders by, they pick up on that heat signature that way. So, acquiring food, now to eat the food. So, for us, um, you think about trying to swallow a watermelon whole. That's probably not going to happen. Uh, we have to cut it up into lovely little pieces and enjoy our food that way. But for a snake, they are able to swallow their food whole due to um, the anatomy of their jaw and their head. So if you look at the um, arrow on the far left there, so right down inside our chin, um, there's like a basically a rubber band, so like so it's able to stretch out really wide that way. And then in the back, so um, mammals actually don't have so this is called a quadrate bone. So mammals don't have a quadrate bone. And with this extra little bone here, they're able to, the snakes are able to open up really wide and open up to 150 degrees. So for us, uh, when our jaws they kind of connect like a puzzle piece really lovely. And for us, we need that bite power. But for snakes, they're not as focused on, you know, biting and chewing, so they need the more the, the flexibility with the quadrate bone that way. And then and the little arrow in the middle there, so snakes do have teeth, besides um, they do have big old things, they do have little teeth. Um, but again, it's not about as much as, you know, chewing and biting as it is kind of guiding the food back down into their throat. And again, it's really not that scary. If you do get bit, it, it's more like, like Velcro, like Velcro scraping the skin. We fine. We <laughs> Um, 
the amounts that they're going to grow in your is not that much. And for us, our skin stretches as we grow. So uh, yes, we slough off skin here and there, but uh, for a snake, their skin does not stretch. So they have to basically shed their whole, you know, whole layer of skin. And basically it comes out like an inside out sock. And they have to kind of, um, they need something to kind of, how do I say, wiggle off the skin. So um, if you're walking around and you see, you know, a snake shed kind of by a rock or a branch, it's because they, they needed something to get rid of their, their posture. <coughs> so again, as ectotherms, they cannot regulate their own body temperature. What happens you know, when it gets cold? Well, again, for us, um, we have our, our hearty metabolism, and for the most part, we can put on you know, some warm layers that keep relatively warm and will instantly freeze. Um, but for snakes, that's not quite the case. So for snakes, they go into overwintering dens, uh, known as hibernacula, and these are usually located on south, southeast or east-facing um, slopes, which is kind of the warmest aspect. Um, they are usually located in mallow burrows, on hillsides, swamping, stuff like that. And the requirement for this is that it sits below the frost line. So getting below the frost line means they're not going to freeze. And the snakes don't actually hibernate, so they don't sleep throughout the winter. They are, uh, go through brumation, excuse me. And so they are fully conscious, fully aware for this period, but their heart rate and their body temperature subsists, well, substantially drops. And because these hibernacles, again, it's so important that they sit below the frost line, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's hibernacles here, there, and everywhere. So because of that, they're kind of far and few. So um, especially down here, we get communal hibernation. So as you can see here in the photo, they have a gray rattlesnake, the yellow belly racer, which I'm actually kind of surprised that the rattlesnake didn't eat the racer right away. But anyways, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so we get different different types of species all hanging out in one hibernacle. So looking at species we have here in Saskatchewan then. So, how many species? Well, we have nine here in Saskatchewan, which is actually the second highest um, in terms of Canadian provinces, only second to Ontario. I think it's pretty good, because Ontario has a lot of reptile species, and especially snakes, so go with us. So, our first one is a smooth green snake. Sometimes uh, you'll hear it being referred as a grass snake. We have the northern red-bellied snakes. Um, these guys aren't super common. They're more so in the um, kind of east, southeast part of our province. The uh, west, sorry, the terrestrial garter snake and the wandering garter snake. The red-sided garter snake. The plains hogwash snake. The eastern yellow-bellied racer, or bull snake. The plains garter snake and our prairie rattlesnake. So nine lovely species that we have here in Saskatchewan. But what about here in the southwest? So in our Grasslands National Park, we have six species. So again, we have the smooth green snake, the plains hognose snake, eastern yellow yellow racer, the bull snake, the plains garter snake, and our prairie rattlesnake. And just north of us, um, like in Sass Landing, um, so about an hour and a half away, uh, you can find just water and garter snakes as well. So although it hasn't been directly recorded down here um, around the park, there is the possibility that there is some in the area. So, uh, starting with our most threatened snake that we have here in the park is the Eastern Yellow Bell Racer. So, um, in terms of morphology and what they look like, so on the top picture there, so they can be olive green, gray, uh, bluish gray, brownish, 
Um, then I have a lovely yellow belly. So, very fitting for the me. Um, and then the bottom there is actually a juvenile, so a neonate. So, when they're born, they have um, these markings and stuff like that. And then as they get older, it gets to be um, just one solid color. And so actually when they are young, they can be mistaken for bull snakes. Um, and if you don't see the rattle, rattlesnakes as well. But um, they're up to five feet in the wild. They've been living over 20 years. Um, they have about three to 12 eggs, um, late in spring, and then hatch late summer. Um, they can be found in grasslands and riparian areas, especially for foraging. And these birds are, as I was saying before, in terms of constriction. Um, so, you know, wrapping their prey really tight and going about that. These guys actually chew or swallow their prey whole. So they're constrictors, but they're a little bit different. And again, as the name suggests, these guys are really fast. They can go up to seven kilometers an hour. And good luck trying to chase them because you don't expect it, but it's kind of fast. <laughs> and then our prairie battle snakes, so these guys are special concern. So, um, kind of see in the top right there, the little rattle. Um, in the bottom photo there, they have like a, a diamond head kind of shape, and then the saddles <clears throat> along their backs, um, so the markings there, sorry. They can be cream or brown, um, stuff like that. And again, they have the, the elliptical pupils and the, um, the heat sensing pits along their face. Pretty iconic. Um, so they can be about three to six feet. They're very thick body. These guys can get really chunky, for sure. Um, in the wild, they live on average about 16 years, but they can live up to 30 years as well. Um, so they have oval Viparous young, um, so live young, so the young develop within the mom, and then what is actually born is live young. So other snakes, um, so the other snakes that I don't mention that they have live young, they just lay eggs and the young um, hatch from the eggs. And they can still re reproduce at age around age 16 to 18. And they have specific areas called rookeries where they lay their young. They can be found in grasslands, downlands, and especially here at prairie dog towns. They primarily forage on small mammals, and their defense mechanism, as we all know, is a rattle and the use of venom. So for our bull snake, which is also <coughs> special concern, and sometimes can be confused with uh, rattlesnakes. So again, like the rattlesnakes, they have the, the markings of the saddling along their back. However, um, they can get a little bit darker in terms of the markings. Their heads are um, not as dummy, the triangular shape, they're a little bit more slender. Again, lacking those really prominent nostril, which are heat sensing bits. Um, and definitely don't have a rattle. However, which I'll get to, um, it can be very deceiving. So these guys can get up to six feet. However, they can extend beyond six feet. Um, in my opinion, they are gentle giants. These are, these are my favorite movies, so the ones that we have here. Um, they're like, oh my goodness, like you pick it up, oh my goodness, and then they're just like, oh, okay, you got me. Cool. <laughs> Okay, cool. Thanks, man. Um, it's a very, very large body. Um, they can live up to 30 years, lay 11 eggs, and again, hatch in late summer. Uh, grasslands, woodlands, fields, um, anthropogenic structures. They primarily feast on small mammals. And as I was saying, um, they mimic rattlesnakes sometimes. So they get like a very, so the name bull snake. They give like a very growly kind of sound from their throat. And they'll also um, kind of flick their tail against grass to mimic the rattle of a rattlesnake. And they'll hiss and they'll do all, all the things of a rattlesnake. But 
They are not virgins. You're fine. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're always fine, but they're fakers. So. Mm -hmm. Again, just, just to compare the rattlesnake, um, the fish structure compared to the false snake there. So, our plains hognose snake, um, which is listed as special concern, probably our cubus snake. Um, so these guys are the western cousin of um, the my study species that I did for my masters. So I did the eastern hognose snake, and these guys are actually really popular in the pet trade. However, it is not legal in Saskatchewan to own them. That's a gene first or something. Okay. Um, so they can be one and a half to two feet long. Um, they're a medium-sized snake, but they are. So very thick body in the wild of uh, eight to fourteen years, but again they are very popular in the pet trade, so it can be much longer than that. Laying about two to twenty-three eggs, hatch in late summer, grassland, scrubland, and desert. So with their upturned noses, so they're able to in areas with um, well-drained soils and sandy soils. They're actually able to use their kind of upturned noses as a shovel, and if they are in a pinch, they can make a burrow and go below ground. So um, it's not a, as much of a thing for our plains hognose to, to do that, but they do still have the ability to use their schnauz as a shovel. So pretty cool. Um, they also primarily are uh, toad specialists, but they will eat bones and other insects. And these guys are actually rear fanged, so they have fangs at the back of the mouth and in the front. And the initial thought was that, um, you know, they're ingesting toads, and so that they have these rear fangs to kind of, if the toad pops up in their mouth, to deflate it. That has not been proven, but it is a thought. So, but yes, these guys are rear fanged. And these guys are extremely, extremely. Uh, they will <laughs> mimic a cobra or play it. Very, very fun. Um, so, on the left here, I'm going to say, so they will raise their head up, uh, flatten their head and flatten their neck, and pretend to hiss that we are a cobra. Or, um, you may be heard in the news about turns out these snakes. Um, that's hognose snakes. And so they will flip over and play dead, and they'll poop and they'll mask, and they'll just be like, yo, I'm, I'm dead, don't eat me. I actually just saw a video the other day, and it was the most dramatic hog performance I've ever seen in my life. Like, it was Oscar worthy, for sure. <laughs> so, our smooth green snake. Uh, so these guys are not assessed. Um, these are often uh, known as grass snakes, so if you ever hear stories of, oh, I was on the grass, and all of a sudden the grass moved, but it was a snake. Um, that's these guys. They are, they don't get very big. They're quite slender. Um, they're usually a foot and a half, up to two and a half feet. Um, but as you can see, along the back, one's called a green color, and then underneath they'll be um, kind of a cream, yellowy, white color. And if you've ever seen um, a snake that's been hit on the road, and it's like a bright blue, it's likely these guys, unless it has markings, then it's probably a rubber snake. But um, yeah, so it's with the, the blue and the yellow that make up the green, it's the yellow color that disintegrates um, first, so that's why they look blue, basically. Um, in the wild, we don't know how long they live. In captivity, they live uh, around six years. They lay about seven eggs, again, hatch in late summer. Live in prairie, meadow, uh, red prairie, berries, primarily insects. And again, um, their defense mechanism is relying on their camouflage under the grass. And our final one is our uh, plains weather snake, which is not assessed. And this is probably the most common snake that you uh, will see, especially down around here. And if you've seen a snake, um, probably this guy, although there's a lot of rattlesnakes in the park. I've learned that this year. 
Um, but so they have a, a bright orange stripe down their back. They kind of have um, patterning along their back, some spots as well. And then the, the um, sorry, the yellow lines on either side of the orange as well. And they have kind of it's harder to see on here, but kind of um, stripes along their, their face. And um, these are the most common, again, the most common things that we have down here in the south. So they're usually less than 7 centimeters, although they can be quite large and grow up to 110 centimeters. Um, they live 18 to 14 years in the wild, so this is a species that is oviparous, so they gave birth to wild young. Again, um, the babies develop inside, but then what actually comes out, um, or they develop in their eggs inside the mom, but then what actually comes out is the babies themselves. Laying about 2 to 22 eggs um, around grasslands, uh, they'll be in riparian areas, excuse me. Uh, they will forage on insects, fish, and small animals. And their defense mechanism is cleaning. So, um, especially, so they'll, they'll hang around the riparian areas to catch fish, but then they'll also use it as a tactic to swim away. So, studying snakes down here in Grasslands National Park. So, now that I've talked about a bit about snake biology, what snakes we have here in, uh, down in the southwest, as well as uh, you know, what habitats they require, other things like that, what are some threats that you can maybe think of uh, to these, to the snakes down here? Due to the fact that 
targeted road surveys, and we do it in key migration periods. So while we, you know, when we come across a snake, if it's alive, we can shuffle it off the road. Um, can't do that for every snake, and so sometimes we end up finding some squished pancakes on the road. But what did we see throughout this year? Well, in terms of proportion of sightings, so on the left there from 2016 to 2020, so keeping in mind that was pre this pilot project, but within the time frame of our uh, traffic management strategy being um, initiated. Um, and then on the right is this year with our uh, new project. So regardless though, prairie battle snakes so at the top there and plains garter snakes at the bottom constituted the greatest proportion of our sightings. So over 80% of prairie rat or of sightings uh, constituted by prairie battle snakes and plains garters. And we did see others like bull snakes and racers, but um, there's a substantial amount of rattlesnakes and garter snakes. And then in terms of average sightings per year, so again, keeping in mind traffic management strategy, um, 2016 to 2020, and then the project um, this year, as well as actively driving roads looking for these snakes. Um, so on the left, so prairie rattlesnakes, for example, we saw about 9 point, on average, 9.6 per year, and this year we saw 40 per year. And turning your attention then to the bottom there for plains garter snakes, so we saw about 14.4 on average per year, and this year I found 112. So with doing the targeted surveys, uh, I was able to, on average, find five times more greater sightings with the surveys. Um, so in terms of, you know, key periods, so when these snakes are traveling back and forth, uh, to the high maximum, so during the spring and during, their, during fall, this is when the snakes are largely getting hit on roads. Again, lots of roads need to get there, to and from there, so bisecting the roads and getting hit on the roads. So in terms of hot spots and what we've found so far, um, so in the center there where that red dot is, so that's um, concentrated around uh, the campground here in the park, and this was analyzed using kernel density estimates from our data. And then just north of that, there's another hot spot, and then just north of that one, um, the other yellow spot, that is near um, Snake pit, so our largest snake hybrid actual. So not super surprising, but um, it is nice to you know to actually see. Okay, these are some these are some hot spots. So up note uh, for 2021, we had over 20,000 visitors. So in that time span, you know, 20,000 visitors were then exposed to our messaging and our programming, and you know there was. There's really a push for snake awareness, so hopefully some people got the point across that we have snakes and roads are a threat. So, solutions. Well, we could put hydras <laughs> on every snake, except for the fact that well, they have no legs, so you really have to keep on, and they shed their skin, so they go off. So probably not the best solution. Um, we do already have speed reduction signs in the areas of our Prado colonies along our eco road. So that is beneficial, but it's not targeted towards snakes. So you know maybe the implementation of those as well, or uh, wildlife crossing signs. You know I've heard the myth or the people have been under the impression that if you see a wildlife crossing sign that the animals are going to cross at that point. <laughs> that is not the case. Um, usually they're put in areas where, uh, you know, there's, there's hot spots for crossing. So um, these are an idea. However, people, there's been studies that have been 
shown that people do get complacent. Um, or there's been times where people just don't even see the sign. Especially, you know, we have lots of wonderful things to look at. There's bison, there's prairie dogs, so sometimes you miss things. So in terms of next steps, um, so looking at, again, mitigation strategies, high this vests or not high this vests. Um, maybe something like installing eco passages or uh, wildlife friendly or wildlife, sorry, fencing. Um, maybe that's a possibility to keep trying to keep snakes off the road and trying to uh, funnel them into certain areas to cross. Um, looking at the effectiveness of our targeted road surveys. Again, you know, I did find a lot more snakes this year by driving the roads compared to us passively doing it. But who knows, maybe it was just a, a good year for snakes on the road. So try to see you know, if, if we're hitting all the, the hot spots and um, we're picking up the data that we need to. As well as, you know, with our data, what can we do in terms of policy? So, you know, if we're finding all these hot spots and um, stuff like that, and in terms of speed, and, you know, can we um, inform our future policies and update them as well. So, that is that. Why care about snakes? Oh, oh my god. Uh, yeah, I'm supposed to be a cow and a snake and a mouse there. Um, snakes help the, the food chain and the food web, you know, flow. They act as predators to keep uh, worm populations in check. They act as prey for things like growing owls, um, coyotes, even you know, larger snakes and even on smaller snakes. So keeping that uh, food chain and food web going. As well as snakes are cool. <laughs> they might be. But um, no. So the, again, the fact that they're living, breathing beings just out of the landscape, just trying to live their lives. Um, As well, um, in terms of human health, so again, by feeding on rodents, keeping those rodent populations in check, um, we're able to, or the snakes, are able to decrease the chance of uh, transmission for zoonotic diseases, so like hantavirus, um, as well as, so the copperhead snake, so their venom, um, is actually, there's a compound derived from it that has helped to in breast cancer treatment. So they help with uh, human health as well. And another economic benefit is again keeping those rodent populations in check. So they are free pest control and they are really good at their job. So in terms of, you know, the rodent populations were to explode and they can go to town on your crops like, ooh, that's delicious. So there's that economic benefit, benefit of you know keeping our crops getting healthy and so that we can have toast in the morning. So how can you help? Well, not everyone is fortunate enough to work with them. I understand that. Um, but the simplest, the absolute simplest thing is just let them be. They are so afraid of you, like you. Nothing to be afraid of. <laughs> they are like, wow, this alien is coming at me. And like, you know, if you think about it, if an alien was coming up to you, you're a big giant, you'd probably freak out too. So when they're freaking out, it's because a big alien is coming up. But otherwise, they want nothing to do with you. And they will give you as much warning that they are in the area as possible. So they're rattling everything. Like, I am here, just leave me be. Um, another way is to slow down while you're driving if it's safe to do so. If you see something looking very stick-like or something poop-like, cow tie-like, maybe slow down. Um, another thing is learning about them. So coming to this presentation, learning about their biology, learning about their needs, learning about the fact that they are 
like that scary, that they want nothing to do with us, and they are economically beneficial. Um, so learn about them, and then pass them on that knowledge to others. Again, really trying to work to dispel the negative stigma around snakes. Um, because again, we've grown up with in the media, in the books, and you know, movies and stuff like that, that snakes are really bad and really awful, but they're not. They are living green beings out on the landscape, just like us, and they're pretty cool. So, that's all I have, but I do have to ask again now the question of who likes snakes?